we human beings live in an uncertain place, always slipping towards a fluid sea of eternity. Our surroundings seem in constant change, like the tides, the rising and setting of the sun, the bustle and surge of human affairs. and the building and wrecking of our structures. We know we cannot take the tangible things we've earned in our lives with us when we die, but we can leave monuments and milestones behind us to mark our way for the generations who follow us. To do any good, these must last through time so they are often made of stone. Stone rots and wears very slowly. Stone and earth, these are the bones and teeth and gums of our world. We can use these to tether and stimulate our thoughts, our history, our imaginations. In addition to its permanence, there is a fascination with the material composition of stone, its grain, and its intricate crystal structure, the plants and animals that live on it. The most lasting history of mankind is written in stone. Here are some of my favorite great stone structures. Journeys to gravestones, tombs, crypts, and memorials of stone. We know that we are born, grow, live, learn, and die. Our bodies turn to dust. Can we leave something behind? Something to tell the living who we were, what we did, when and how long we lived, and perhaps how we died. Gravestones and markers are amongst the oldest artifacts of mankind. They exist in an endless variety of shapes and sizes. Some are incredibly ancient and date back to our Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon ancestors. There are plain and massive menhirs, sculptures in the form of male organs, some with turbans, mysterious stones erected by the Picts and covered with cabalistic etchings. Something beautiful and unique. Something which speaks in universal visual language of the spirit which animated the human being. The living can be touched by the simple sincerity of graves in a vast landscape. A landscape like this one on the moors of Highland Scotland where the shepherd tended his flock in summer and winter. The passing clouds, the wild deer, the blowing heather evoke a life. Or the remote descendants of the ancient Egyptians can marvel at the human effort, at the cost and time and treasure of the great pyramids in the desert. That design has endured thousands of years and still speaks of the Pharaoh's passion for immortality. We begin with the Stone Age. Tombs of our Paleolithic ancestors are thickly scattered throughout the world. They often consist of a mound of earth reinforced with rock slabs and covering a long entrance passage which ends in a chamber.
There the honored dead were exposed until they became dust and bone. From time to time, the tomb was opened to add new remains. Great and small, hundreds of these passage graves have survived four or 5,000 years to intrigue us today. Bryn Selidu is a mound on the Welsh island of Anglesey. It was begun about 3,000 years before Christ and was rebuilt and reused through the entire Iron Age. Perhaps entering it symbolized a passage back to the womb of Mother Earth, the source of all life to the ancients. The Lydian burial mounds of Bin Tepe near Sardis in Turkey are on a much larger scale. It is a city of mounds, with the smaller tombs of noble families grouped around the vast mountains of the royal kings. The smaller mounds have a long corridor passage and a burial chamber. They have been robbed and reused, perhaps to bury the victims of a plague. A giant mound in the center of the complex, sometimes called the Gyges Mound, is nearly a mile in circumference. It was piled during historic times, perhaps in the sixth century BC. For more than 60 years, modern archeologists have mined to try to discover its secrets. The Greek historian Herodotus tells us it was built by three guilds the tradesmen, the artisans, and the prostitutes, in homage to the king, with the prostitutes contributing the greatest portion of labor. He says that hidden randomly somewhere within its mass is a tomb chamber full of treasure, but its whereabouts has baffled robbers since Roman times. This man-made mountain is called Split Belly Mound by the natives because of a gash in its side opened by ancient thieves. It is riddled with robbers' tunnels. These thieves must have worked alone and in the dark, piling the spent earth behind them. None of these has led to the tomb chamber. Martin archaeologists have been tunneling since 1962, following striations made when the mound was piled. They have found an unfinished circular wall buried deep within the mound, but so far, no evidence of a burial chamber. Pharaohs, kings, emperors, nobles, the ancients were usually buried with treasures to accompany them in the afterlife. If the tomb is above ground, and in the public eye, it has almost always been robbed. Most tombs, like the pyramids of Egypt, have a passageway leading to the treasure chamber, and ingenious and persistent thieves overcome every obstacle the builders put in their way to reach and rob it. The tomb of Cyrus the Great whose vast Persian empire stretched from the Mediterranean Sea to India was built about 530 BC. Cyrus knew the common fate of tombs when he wrote, O oh man, whatever you are and wherever you come from, for I know you will come, I am Cyrus, who won the Persians their empire. Do not therefore begrudge me this bit of earth which covers my bones. His prestige and his legacy protected his body in its golden coffin for 200 years until the arrival of Alexander the Great, who was conquering his own empire. Then it was gone, and for close to 2,400 years, 
the tomb chamber has been empty. His capital city of Pasargadai, with all its buildings and palaces and gardens, has melted away to ruins around it. Yet Saros was right, and people still come by the thousands to this remote place to imagine his vanished greatness. Some of the Persian kings who inherited his empire, including Darius I, carved their tombs into a cliff face at Naquash e Rustam. Here the chambers were cut out of reach, high on the rock face. There were no steps or ladders, yet they are long since emptied of sarcophagus and treasure. Subsequent rulers have added heroic reliefs at a lower level. In the end, locating a tomb chamber randomly within a great pile of earth is the only strategy which has baffled both ancient robbers and modern archaeologists. Constructions like the split belly mound require many years of organized labor from the society which builds them. The workers may be slaves or free, but they must be dedicated to the idea of immortality. Immortality for a leader who lives forever in an afterlife and in the minds of the people. Thus, eons later, we still know the name and face of the great Pharaoh Ramses of Egypt. Fast forward thousands of years. Contemporary America has whole mountains which have been sculpted into memorials. At Mount Rushmore and the Black Hills of South Dakota, four portraits of the most distinguished American presidents have been carved into the living rock. The process took 15 years and millions of dollars. The images are 60 feet tall and visible for miles. Like the colossal sculptures of Egypt, the work began with hammer and chisel, but proceeded with dynamite and pneumatic drills. A thousand obstacles had to be overcome. The right stone mountain had to be found, and the objections of native Indians, for whom Mount Rushmore is sacred ground, settled. The four presidents had to be selected, and Congress had to provide funding, and in the end, work had to stop before the portraits became full length because money ran out. Now, Mount Rushmore is a national icon. Like the ancient colossi, such massive efforts are usually driven by a single exceptional individual. For Mount Rushmore, it was Gutson Borglum, who dedicated 20 years of his life and passed the project to his son, Lincoln, when he died in 1941. In 1924, a young artist named Korzak worked on Mount Rushmore under Borglum. They argued, and Korzak left, and later began a lifetime project called the Crazy Horse Monument on a nearby mountain. Crazy Horse is the Indian chief who conquered and killed U.S. General Custer at the famous last stand on the Little Bighorn. The Crazy Horse Monument stands in a sort of competition with Mount Rushmore, the artist Borglum with the artist Korzak, the white heroes with the Indians they displaced. The face of Crazy Horse is the world's largest portrait sculpture. At 87 feet, it is 27 feet taller than the presidents of Rushmore. The indomitable Korzak began the project single-handed and unfunded until his death in 1982. Then the project descended to his wife and 10 children who continued to sculpt the mountain and run the tourist center at its base. The Crazy Horse Memorial Foundation is committed to supporting the legacy of the American Indian. 
and exists on private donations and sales. It accepts no support from the U.S. government. It is possible to drive up the back of this mountain through this giddy gap underneath Crazy Horse's extended arm. There the slow work of drilling and blasting has gone on for many years and will continue until the work, which began in 1948, is at last finished. Then it will be the largest sculpture in all the world. A poet called it the Rose Red City, half as old as time. Petra is in the country of Jordan, at the intersection of ancient trade routes. It is usually entered through a narrow cleft in the rock, and the first building to strike the eye is a so-called treasury. Its classical pediment, its columns, its urns are inspired by Greece, and Petra flourished under Roman rule in the second century AD. It was the capital and stronghold of the Nabataeans, begun as early as the sixth century BC. Its theater, its public buildings, and especially its hundreds of tombs are hewn from the soft, rose-colored sandstone of its cliffs. The tombs are everywhere, a daily sight for the Nabataeans. Sometimes they are mere caves, and other times hollowed chambers with finished portals. There are almost no inscriptions, perhaps because the soft stone has eroded. The doors of wood are missing, for all these tombs have been robbed and reused and often lived in over the centuries. Some Bedouin families still make their homes here. The key to life in Petra was its water supply, vital in this desert environment. The whole city was carved to collect rainwater and funnel it to underground cisterns for future use. The city and its tombs were abandoned after the Arab conquest of 662 AD. Most cultures settle into a common pattern for tombstones and grave markers. Like the fashions of different periods in dress and clothing, there are fashions in tombstones. In colonial New England, the favored material was slate, and most tombstones looked the same. But the most interesting memorials are for unique individuals, revered by their families and perhaps by their culture. In the Mortlake churchyard, in a suburb of London, is the tent tomb of Richard Burton. Burton was an extraordinary man, a daring explorer, who was the first white man to penetrate forbidden Mecca in disguise, and twice penetrated darkest Africa to search for the sources of the Nile. He spoke 26 languages and translated the Arabian Nights and the Kama Sutra into fluid English. He fearlessly explored the sexual experiences and customs of other cultures and scandalized Victorian England in the process. He married late, and his devoted wife Isabel was his companion throughout his adventures in Arabia and the Near East. When he died, she built him a stone tent, perfect in every detail, to symbolize their explorations together. By crawling up a ladder behind the tomb, the visitor can peep inside through a glass window. Their coffins lie in silent companionship where they once slept. Camel bells and lamps and coverlets have acquired only a little dust in over a hundred years. Isabel was a Catholic who long tried to convert her agnostic husband. When he died, she burnt his most controversial papers to protect his good name. 
There are some life and death events humanity should never be allowed to forget. One of these is the horrific Armenian genocide of 1915. The ruling Muslim politicians of the Ottoman Empire decided to completely destroy the troublesome Christian minority of Armenia. They uprooted them from their homes, seized and sold their possessions, sent them without food and water on death marches to the Syrian desert. They starved, shot, poisoned, burned, and drowned somewhere between 800,000 and one and a quarter million men, women, and children. Their intention was to murder an entire nation, and the rest of the civilized world allowed it to happen, too paralyzed by politics to stop the killing. It was a lesson not lost on Adolf Hitler when he set out to eradicate the Jews in the second great genocide of the 20th century. He thought the world would understand, or at least forget. It was the task of the architects of the Armenian Genocide Memorial on the outskirts of the capital of Yerevan to teach us to remember. How to explain the horrors and the consequences of that disgusting deed while building hope and courage for a newborn Armenia. The crimes are described in an adjacent museum. A processional featuring memorials to the Armenian towns where massacres occurred and to the foreign authorities who tried to help, including Henry Morgenthau of America and Pope Benedict XV leads to the monument. There, a 140-foot stele, symbolizing the rebirth of Armenia, soars to the heavens. Arched slabs of stone symbolize the 12 Armenian provinces lost to Ottoman Turkey. In this sacred space, an eternal flame burns. People come from all over the world to learn of those terrible events and hope for the future. Governments and nations wish to build memorials to remind their people of war and sacrifice, of peace and accomplishment, of great ideas and the men and women who achieved them. How can this be done? First, Represent the hero, many times larger than life, keeping watch over his people. Fashion him of marble, a shining white stone, standing for purity and integrity. Surround him with the mighty words he composed and spoke. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged. Exalt him, but make him human. Abraham Lincoln was a homely man with outsized hands and feet, tall body, and a face that he thought would look better with a beard. Place this figure in an enormous shrine, a shelter from wind and weather, which welcomes yet dwarfs the crowds of visitors. Make this sacred building in the form of an ancient Greek temple to invoke the beginnings of our Western civilization and democratic government. The workmanship must be of the highest quality, clean, elegant, powerful, beautiful. All this makes the Lincoln Memorial both a destination and an enduring memory for Americans. Whether they are visiting school children, taking selfies, 
or white bearded filmmakers who have studied Lincoln. From the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, the visitor looks down the National Mall and across the reflecting pool to the tall obelisk of the Washington Monument. The city was designed from its beginnings to display the monuments and public buildings of a national capital. Pierre L'Enfant, a French engineer who served in the American Revolution, designed its long, straight boulevards and their intersections, squares, and gathering places. He consulted with George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and gave careful thought to viewpoints with monuments at the end. In fact, the city is designed as the proud showplace of America's greatest leaders and most significant accomplishments. The tidal basin is ringed with monuments to great men and women. A walkway, shaded with cherry trees, leads from one to another, and the public can also take in the view from a paddle boat. And the flag is always flying. The theme of the Martin Luther King Monument is Conquering the Mountain of Fear and Prejudice. The standing sculpture of Reverend King looks out over a large courtyard enclosed by curved walls bearing his mighty words. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. A short walk along the shore brings us to the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial. It undertakes to represent the life of a president who was in office more than 14 years through the Great Depression and the Second World War. The visitor walks through linked courtyards and each new space features a different episode. We begin with the life-altering tragedy of his polio attack which could have left him housebound in a wheelchair for the rest of his days. Instead, he had the courage to run for president in the midst of the national calamity of the Great Depression. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Each new inscription or sculpture engages the public whether it is posing for selfies with the bronze red line, or touching the president's finger, or playing with his famous dog, Fala. When we come to the Second World War, the sculptor turns to the medium of stone to express those dark days of destruction and sacrifice. I have seen war on land and sea I have seen blood running from the wounded. I have seen the dead in the mud. I have seen cities destroyed. I have seen children starving. I hate war. Stone blocks tumble into a still pool as if toppled by bombs. Nearby, a pile of cut blocks suggest a building collapsed by a catastrophic explosion. But children are attracted by this ruin, and their play and pleasure turn our thoughts to hope and renewal. A key to the success of the memorials around the Tidal Basin is their ability to handle enormous crowds of visitors.
The Jefferson Memorial dominates the landscape from a great distance across the water. People come in their hundreds to sun themselves on its vast steps, to gaze across the tidal basin towards downtown Washington, and perhaps to feel proud of their relatively new country's accomplishments. The formula is now familiar, an enormous neoclassic building made of blinding white marble, sheltering a gigantic statue of the author of our Declaration of Independence. The dome is significant, for it echoes the form of Jefferson's home, Monticello in Virginia. He designed and built Monticello himself, and it deliberately models classical Roman buildings. Jefferson contributed enormously to classical revival architecture in America. He felt that the reference to the ancient Roman culture, which dominated the world for many centuries and was reborn in the art and architecture of the European Renaissance, gave dignity to the new American Republic. The words engraved around his statue are the voice of his ambitions. It is appropriate that Jefferson looks across the tidal basin to the Washington Monument, where the two men collaborated over the birth of the new American nation. In fact, the sight of the Washington Monument in the distance visually links together many other monuments. The obelisk is surrounded by open spaces making it visible from all over the city. Those spaces are also ideal for public assembly and even impromptu sports. Monuments to the soldiers whose lives have been sacrificed in our nation's wars must strike a more somber note. This is especially true for recent wars such as the bitter conflicts in Vietnam and Korea, which were either lost or not entirely won. Sometimes gritty realism, like a platoon of dogged infantry glimpsed unexpectedly through the trees, seemed the best way to do them honor. There is still a tense armed border between North and South Korea over 60 years after the armistice was declared. A polished black granite wall runs parallel to the advancing soldiers. On it are etched scenes derived from authentic photographs taken on the battlefields. The reflections of visitors mingle with these images of war. These reflections and the ability to closely examine the details of faces and equipment give the visitor a feeling of being intimately included in the memorial. There is also a place where the staggering price in dead and wounded is recorded. Finally, there is a peaceful pool where ducks live surrounded by flowering trees and the visitor can sit and rest. There, we can meditate on the pleasures and beauty of peace. Maya Lin was only 21 when she designed the Vietnam War Memorial. It is a wall of black stone which stretches over two acres. It rises slowly and vertically from the grass, reaches a height of 12 feet, turns a corner and runs slowly back into the earth. So people are created, 
live their lives, and return to the dust. Almost 60,000 American soldiers, both men and women, died in this bloody war. And in the end, we lost. What was it all for? And how can we survivors of these bitter years honor each personal sacrifice? The name of every dead victim is engraved into the mirror black surface of the wall. There are books where you can locate each family member, friend, and neighbor. You can find the place, reach and touch the name, and perhaps leave a message or a flower for the life lost. Your image will be reflected from the stone, and so the living can be photographed with the dead. The wall is like an abstract wound in the earth. When it was built in 1981, it was too abstract for many Americans, who wanted realistic statues of soldiers carrying deadly weapons, alert and unafraid, with their buddies at their backs. America's war in Vietnam divided the country with bitter controversy, but its memorial has proved to be the most popular of the nation's war memorials. It is good this statue group was added later in the spirit of compromise. The soldiers appear to be staring at the wall. Great public monuments can inspire the people and renew a nation's pride and faith in its values. Tamerlane the Conqueror, whose Asian Empire was just a little smaller than the Roman Empire at its height, was a particularly brutal conqueror. When he sacked a city, he would often butcher the entire population, men, women, and children, he would make piles of their skulls in the burnt-out marketplaces. Yet the buildings he erected as memorials to his empire, to himself, and to his wife are stunning in their majestic beauty. His lands and his cities have been overrun by other empires many times since his death in 1405, but his magnificent memorials survive. As the cities of Central Asia emerged from their centuries-long domination, first by the Russian Empire and then by the Soviet Union, the old statues of Lenin are toppled and replaced by statues of Tamerlane. His brutalities are overlooked. His buildings are a worldwide tourist destination and a focus of national pride. Tombs can glorify a political leader, enlarge and perpetuate a myth or an idea, become a symbol for a certain social order. But personal memorials mark the periods of life for ordinary people. We often group our dead together in silent companionship in a place which we can visit to remember, mourn, and meditate. In colonial New England, where the Christian religion was all important, the dead were buried in the churchyard. The church was the center of life, where the people gathered on Sunday to worship, and where great events of life, from marriages to funerals, were celebrated. 
the church and its yard, sheltered and protected both the living and the dead. The tombstones were modest and similar, engraved with date of birth and death, and perhaps a title, and an expression of faith in a just God and eternal heaven. Some of the distinctions between members of the congregation might be preserved in their graves with larger or more ornate tombstones for more distinguished individuals. From his family plot, the Reverend Isaac Lyman, born in 1724, and for more than 60 years, the beloved pastor of the First Church of York, still presides over his congregation. It is a pleasure for his descendants to remember his unselfish life here. But by the 1830s, the American population was exploding. Urban churchyards were getting overcrowded and even unsanitary in wet weather. A movement called the Garden Cemetery was born. It drew inspiration from the great English parks and estates. The concept was to landscape an expansive area with lagoons and vistas, planted with rare horticulture and carefully maintained by devoted gardeners. Families would purchase numbered plots. Tombs and memorials would be built around hills and ponds and connected together with winding walks and carriage roads. Birds and small animals would be attracted to this green and natural park. People would come not just to commune with the departed, but to walk, jog, meditate, and recreate. There would be no limit to the shape size and character of the stone tombs. Individual artistic expression and even storytelling would be encouraged. Generations of families would be gathered in the same area. Rather than a single church, there would be towers and chapels and funerary sculpture inspired by other cultures and ages. Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, was founded in 1831 and thus has been a pleasant and thoughtful destination for nearly 200 years. <laughs>